Our next speaker, Leslie Johnston, is going to tell us a little bit about a plane crash and how that made her walk her walk. Leslie gets bored easily, she says. Uh, despite a rather innocuous childhood in the Midwest, she manages to seek out experiences that her mother calls scary. Uh, she's hitchhiked across the Middle East. She's worked on an Alaskan fishery. And she's missed being stranded by a coup in an African country by minutes, I believe. Uh, she manages the Argidius Foundation uh, and it, helping entrepreneurs in developing countries. Uh, this has led to her shocking experience in a plane crash in 2005. Leslie, walk the crash. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Congrats. Excellent. Great. Thanks, Jack. Um, and uh, just a few points of clarification. I was actually a week from the coup, so there's a little bit more comfort. Uh, and uh, <laughs> it happened before my, my, current, my current role. Um, well, let me just start and, and ask a question, because I'm sure most of you uh, travel a lot. And I actually I really like traveling. I, I love flying, and I fly a lot. Um, I fly a lot at my current position, and I flew a lot when I lived in Africa for about 10 years. And as you're up in the, the air and you're looking down at the clouds, do you ever wonder if your plane will go down? I do. And I did before the crash. I always think that. I think it's maybe the, the morbid uh, part of me, but uh, I always wonder that. And if it did go down, you wonder, is there a safer place for it to land? I really don't want to crash into a mountain, and I wouldn't want to crash in Mexico City, the sprawling metropolis, but there are actually some nice places out there to crash. And <laughs> this was where I crashed. And this is a lovely island. It's in a place uh, called the Carimbas Archipelago, which is in northern Mozambique. Uh, it's uh, stunning group of about 22 coral islands and you can see it has nice powdery white sandy beaches and ocean views and this was 2005 um, it even had wireless internet rooms which is very unusual and this is where the plane crashed but what this island did not have uh, was a decent runway and in fact when this happened in fact, the, the runway wasn't really a runway, it was more of an airstrip. And, and when this happened, uh, the plane, upon uh, descending, hit something. Uh, we're not quite sure what it was, bits and bobs. And when it hit it, uh, it flipped. And after it flipped, it caught on fire. So here I was, uh, upside down, in this little plane with about 10 other passengers, um, smelling smoke. And I looked in front, and it was hard to look because I actually was uh, six months pregnant at the time as well. So I had my, my big belly upside down and looked in front, and I saw the pilot sort of scurrying and leaving the plane like, like, a, like a bat out of hell. He was out of there. And, and I started thinking, isn't the pilot supposed to stay until the last passenger evacuates? You know, you think of captains and, and, and passengers on ships. And uh, then I thought, well, maybe the, the maritime laws are different from the aviation laws of accidents. But I could smell something. And I smell that the plane was on fire and there was smoke and he was getting the heck out of there. And in fact, everyone was getting out there. And I tried to unbuckle my, my seatbelt and couldn't. Um, and I think probably the very large belly with the seatbelt wedged hanging upside down has something to do with that. And, um, and I was scared. Um, and I uh, didn't really know what to do. And luckily, I turned to my left, and my colleague, Eddie, uh, was still in the plane. In fact, Eddie, who was at the top of the plane, which was upside down, um, was very calm because he was looking for his laptop. He didn't want his laptop to be <laughs> stuck in the plane. And I couldn't believe it. And here's this man, South African, who was actually experiencing, I would find out later, his second plane crash. <laughs> and so, thank goodness for Eddie, because he reached up and very calmly let me out, and I fell down and we scurried out of the plane. 
Um, and I don't really remember too much what happened after that, but what I do remember is Eddie was gathering all the passengers for a photo op while the, <laughs> the, the, the burning hulk of the plane was behind us. I mean, it was really surreal. And then we, we somehow got escorted to the, <laughs> the recovery ward, which was actually more of the um, honeymoon suite, and because there was no medical uh, personnel on this small island. Uh, the staff were really nice. In fact, they couldn't really help us medically, and, and a couple of us were, were pretty, in pretty bad shape. Um, they served us um, rum-based fruit drinks. And I, I'm not kidding. I mean, I sound glib saying this, but they actually came with platters of sort of Mai Tais. And uh, we sat there <laughs> sipping these, um, not wondering, <laughs> wondering if we'd be okay. And, and the, the bottom line is, is I was okay, everyone was okay, no one died, um, but I, I didn't actually know if my child would be okay. And that, that was what the scary thing was, because um, this place is quite remote, and it took 14 hours and four flights for me to medically evacuate. And that's a really long day if you don't really know if everything is okay um, down there. And as... This was my first child. Um, I was scared. And luckily, am I going to start getting emotional now? Sorry. I've never talked about this in front of so many people before. But luckily, everything was okay. And. This experience really made me think about things and made me think actually about a lot of things, about choices I'd made in life. And here I was, um, about to become a new mother, and uh, you know, I think this sounds um, really cliched, but I think um, it, it really did bring home the fact that life is short and life is fragile. And, you really need to make the most of it. And this was the kick in the pants I needed. And I think that the interesting thing to me is, is um, you know, I've, I've, I had already made a choice. I, I was actually living in Mozambique when this happened. And, um, sorry, I'm very emotional. <laughs> and I'd made the choice two years earlier um, to live and work in Mozambique. and, and work in development. In fact, DJ had um, actually echoed many of the themes that um, drove me personally to, to live and, and work in Mozambique um, and help people um, to improve their lives. Um, so I'd made that choice, but, but this, this experience really drove home the, the need um, for me to actually have a little bit more, um, a little bit more meaning in my own life. And for me, that meant personally, um, not only um, you know, doing what I thought was good, but doing it in a certain way. And in fact, it, it made me question um, really three, three decisions I've made in my life. Um, and the, the first one is, uh, and again, this, this may sound a little bit glib, um, but it's something I do think about. Um, the first one was, um, it made me really, really regret something I did when I was in university, and that was to take a statistics course. And the reason why, because I'm a very emotional person, as you know, but, uh, and I get on a plane every other week, and I really like to think when I get on that plane that I have less of a chance of being in a crash, because I've already had my crash, you know, so I, I have, you know, a check in that box, but anyone who's taken a stats course knows that's not true. It's a roll of the dice, we gamble every time, and I have just as much chance as any of you of going down again, possibly not in such a nice place. Um, and in fact, on, the, on that, that note, um, I actually have a lot of bad luck on planes. Um, this was quite a serious accident, um, clearly not as bad as having your face um, chewed off by a bear. Um, that could be another TED talk, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, this, 
Following this accident, I, I, I've had uh, a few other scrapes and bruises, including being hit by lightning on Air Malawi, uh, where the, the plane uh, heated up like a toaster oven, um, and uh, some emergency stops in Swaziland, and, and of course the, the, the food on some of these internal flights in Nigeria is just horrible and can lead to horrible things. So a lot of really bad experiences. Um, and. Uh, for anyone flying to Amsterdam tomorrow morning, I'm on the 720 flight, so just so you know. Um, but joking aside, um, what this did do, and again, I go back to DJ's point, because I think she made a very, very good point, is this, this made me really realize that I want to do good in life, and I want to do something that's meaningful. And, you know, and I think at the end of the day, we all want to do good. Um, I actually really true believe, truly believe that it's, it's in our, our nature, um, as fellow humans, to want to help others. Uh, I think it's really hard when you see someone that needs help not to respond. And we choose to respond in different ways, whether it's writing a check or helping out with a helping hand. But I, I think most of us would, would respond. Um, and in fact, there's so many do-gooders out there. When you actually look at the level of aid going into places like Africa, it's astounding and frightening, actually, because you wonder what happens to all that money billions and billions and billions of dollars. Which brings me to the real choice that this experience um, has, has really um, brought home for me. And, and that choice was um, not just to do good, um, but to do good well, to be smart about development, and to use my skills and the resources I might have um, to help others, as, as DJ said, to help themselves. And that's really important to me, and, and I think I was very lucky um, shortly after this experience to meet someone um, who I think embodied really uh, what, what I think is, is the key to having real impact in helping people to help themselves. And this is an entrepreneur, and his name is Temba. Um, Temba grew up in the northwest corner of Swaziland, and he is probably the most inspiring person I've met in a long time. Um, he grew up in a poor family, and his first job was actually as a farm laborer, picking vegetables on this farm, uh, which was shipping them off for export to Europe. And what's interesting is Temba worked his way up. Uh, he went from farm laborer eventually to farm manager. And when the owner of the farm got into a couple dodgy deals and got out of town, the farm went up for sale. And Temba, who has no business training whatsoever, but very strong technical background, very smart man, walked into a Swazi bank and applied for a loan to buy the farm. And he did. And to me, that's incredible. And all of a sudden, he has this farm in this pack house, but not a lot of cash to do very much with it. And that's when I met him. I was very lucky to meet him um, through the organization I was working with at the time. Uh, and he needed some help. He was smart, he had gumption. In fact, he's the most humble guy I've met in a long time. He's a quiet leader. And, you know, and I think people really looked up to him and really looked at him as a, a model in his community. And he's very focused. He knew what he wanted to do. He knew he wanted to grow this business, but he needed some help, some smart help. And with a little bit of mentoring, actually quite a lot of mentoring, about a year and a half or so, and some new investment, external investment, he was able to get this business off its feet. And that's really exciting to me because I think he alone, in a quite a poor area of Swaziland, created 150 permanent jobs by doing that. But what's more important, he's actually helped raise the quality of the produ producers around his farm and what I mean by that is he's surrounded by Swazis who basically are subsistence farmers. Um, they live by the corn that they grow, or maize, as they call it. And he started working with these farmers um, really to mitigate one of his own risks um, as a business person. He was uh, challenged with um, poor cash flow, um, but he also uh, had a lot of setbacks like uh, hail, hitting his farm um, three times and wiping out his crop. 
And that, of course, wipes out the cash and puts him in a very vulnerable position. He decided to mitigate that risk by working with smallholder farmers, um, known as outgrower farmers, those that, that know this industry, um, and helping them get sophisticated enough to be able to grow the products that he wanted to export. And one of those products is this. And this is called a patty pan. And I'm just very curious, how many of you know what a patty pan is? So, okay, that's pretty impressive. Um, I didn't know what a patty pan was. Um, my horticultural advisor, uh, an incredible woman um, named De Debbie Cutting, taught me a lot about patty pans. Um, but if I didn't know what a patty pan was, can you imagine what a rural farmer in the middle of nowhere in Swaziland, would they know how to grow these things? Probably not. They can grow maize, they can grow sorghum, but this is a little bit more complicated. And what Temba did is he actually provided mentorship, he provided inputs, he provided support, and he bought, he was the market, to help these farmers actually start diversifying, and instead of just growing corn and feeding themselves and the family, growing a higher value crop and putting that extra money into their, their families. And because of that, many of these farmers are able to send their kids to school for the first time, and he's really raising the bar. And it's people like Temba that really inspire me. Um, and I think that, you know, I was lucky. When I think back to this experience, I, I was very lucky I got a second chance. Um, and I think that, you know, from my own perspective and my, my, um, my career, I want to help find the Tembas of the world and help them have a second chance as well because I think there's a lot of them out there, but it's hard to find them. And I guess in closing, when I retire, which will be unfortunately in a very, very long time, <laughs> 25 years, I think, um, but when I retire, I hope that I could have said that I've done a lot of good in my life and I've helped people find their second chance the same way I did. And I might even go back to that island because I think it'd be really interesting to go back, sit in that honeymoon suite, sip a Mai Tai, if they're still selling those, and think about what I would have accomplished. To me, that would be really, really satisfying. But the one thing I can say, I'll definitely take the boat. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>